clear. This is some of the best footage of a multiple vortex tornado up until this point, rivaling the Edmonton tornado three years earlier. The aforementioned tornado in Edmonton was so wild, complex, and dangerous that it deserves a deeper look. The erratic damage path, the sheer strength and power, and the location alone make this tornado one of the most interesting twisters of all time. Tornado climatology in Canada is very interesting. On average, Canada sees about 100 tornadoes per year, which is pretty low when compared to the United States' 1,200 tornadoes per year. The actual average of reported tornadoes per year in Canada is 62. However, many weak, short-lived tornadoes remain unaccounted for, as they often occur in rural areas. In terms of the distribution of tornadoes in Canada, there isn't really a clear-cut tornado alley. The general rule is the further south you are, the greater the tornado frequency. Saskatchewan sees 18 per year, Alberta 15 per year, and Ontario about 12 per year, the vast majority of these tornadoes occurring in the southern half of each province. Only one F5 has occurred in Canada, and there have been five F4s since 1980. So the chances of a violent lawn track tornado barreling through the center of a capital city in Canada are very, very rare. But it happened in 1987. It was a pretty good year for the city of Edmonton. The Oilers had just won their third Stanley Cup and were in the middle of their run as one of the greatest NHL teams of all time. While the celebration continued into July, the weather only got hotter. A giant ridge of high pressure had been building, pushing warm, humid air into the extreme high plains of Alberta. Just look at how intense this ridge is. Temperatures were in the mid to upper 80s, that's about 30 degrees Celsius, for the majority of the week. Meanwhile, an area of lower pressure was slowly building off the coast of British Columbia, but was unable to move east due to the sheer intensity of the ridge. This tension continued to build throughout the week, and on Friday, July 31st, the weather whiplash occurred. There were a lot of ingredients in place for a tornado outbreak. You had tremendous speed shear happening in the lower portion of the atmosphere over southern Alberta. The air high in the atmosphere was traveling 75 knots, or 140 kilometers an hour, through this portion of the jet stream right over Edmonton. And this is where we need to talk about vorticity. Vorticity is just the spinning of air. Big word, simple meaning. And as you can probably guess, the spinning of air is a very important parameter when talking about tornadoes. A spinning motion in the atmosphere can be induced by many different things, but most often the jet stream is where this vorticity starts. You see, the jet stream rarely ever moves in a straight line. It lifts, it dives, there's troughs, there's ridges, Sometimes it even loops back on itself and creates a closed low. Within these troughs and ridges are smaller kinks called shortwave troughs. And while long wave troughs often dictate the weather pattern for the next couple of days, the shortwave troughs are where all the action occurs. Shortwave troughs are often very difficult to spot due to their subtlety. But if we look closely at the jet stream at 6 a.m. on the 31st, you can see a bend right here. This is the shortwave trough, and it's what causes the disturbance in the atmosphere needed to start many tornado outbreaks. Now, if we draw a line across the tightest gradient right here, we get what is called the trough axis. Just ahead of this axis to the northeast, the wind is diverging or spreading apart. It's also moving faster on the outer edge of the jet stream than on the inner edge, which creates a spinning motion. This is where the vorticity is maximized, and beneath this area, air is able to rise, leading to thunderstorms. This area was ground zero for what would be a very bad day in Edmonton. Throughout the morning, thunderstorms exploded to the southwest of Edmonton, making their way across Alberta. At 1.40 p.m., a severe weather watch was issued by the Alberta Weather Center, for this area around Edmonton, setting the likelihood of violent thunderstorms. Even if tornadoes didn't materialize, this area of Canada is known for getting very severe hailstorms and flash flooding. It turns out that all three of these severe weather events happened on the 31st. It's also important to note here that Doppler weather radar wasn't available in Edmonton in 1987. A mass installation and upgrade to a C-band Doppler system didn't even occur until about a decade later, so tornado warnings were still very much issued by sight first. These storms continued to intensify, and at 2.45 p.m., the Alberta Weather Center issued a severe weather warning for the Edmonton metro area. The rough 
equivalent to a severe thunderstorm warning. About 10 minutes later, a very short-lived tornado touched down to the east of Leduc, causing little damage. But six minutes later, a second tornado would touch down from the same storm just to the north of Beaumont. The tornado was a lawn-thin stovepipe and continued quickly to the northeast. Many citizens in the surrounding area were calling both the police and the weather center reporting a sighting of a tornado, and a tornado warning did go out at 3.04 p.m. However, not everyone was weather aware that day due to the infrequent nature of violent Canadian tornadoes. One of these police officers who was manning the phones, Bill Clark, assumed that these reports he received were inaccurate and that most people in Edmonton wouldn't even know how to correctly identify a tornado by sight. But as the calls kept pouring in, it became pretty clear that a tornado was on the way. What was a small tornado had now grown considerably in size. This video, taken from Ellerslie Road, shows the tornado still on the ground, but the condensation funnel isn't visible. And then the tornado moved into the Millwoods area, one of the first expansive suburban areas in Edmonton built in the 1970s. And this is where the most infamous video of this tornado was taken. This footage was taken less than half a mile from the tornado and showcases the absolutely wild multiple vortices within the parent tornado. Oh my goodness, look at that. What is that? That's a cloud. Oh, That's a funnel cloud. It's incredible that the tornado at this point was only producing F2 damage. In total, 32 homes in Millwoods experienced significant damage. As the tornado continued to the north, the main condensation funnel began to reach towards the ground again. The continued disappearance of the condensation funnel at times made residents believe that the tornado had actually lifted. Listen to this conversation between resident Bill Kerr and his wife. Coming over here like your mother said. It's not a tornado anyway, it's a cloud now. Tornado's gone. Tornado's gone. But a mere few seconds later, the condensation funnel returned. Oh man. You found a nut yep. oh. Holy cow! The western areas experienced intense hail, larger than softballs, which damaged many vehicles, ripped the shingles off of houses, and broke the windows on the second floor of homes. The tornado continued into east central Edmonton, known as the industrial area and refinery row. Traveling nearly parallel to 34th Avenue, this is where the most intense damage occurred. These photos taken from the Atlas of the Edmonton Tornado and Hailstorm show the destruction to dozens of steel warehouses. Near 64th Avenue, the Nault sawmill collapsed. On 76th Avenue, the roof was torn off the Dillingham and Moltec construction building. Near 94th Avenue, it clipped the infamous Stelco steel mill. To the north along Baseline Road, the Alberta Trust Company was obliterated. This oil tank was lifted into the air and thrown several hundred feet onto Railway Street. Crossing over Baseline Road, several trucking firms took a direct hit as dozens of trailers were tossed into the air like toys. Several trains along the CN rail line were derailed. These trains contained anhydrous ammonia and sulfuric acid, two toxic corrosive substances that would be very dangerous to tissue upon contact. 12 people in the industrial area were killed. Unfortunately, with the tornado hitting before 4 p.m., many people were still working and ended up getting trapped underneath piles of debris. Dozens of cars were flipped or thrown off the road, many with people trapped inside. The downed power lines, industrial debris blocking the road, and lack of available ambulances made getting people to the hospital that much more difficult. Luckily, as the tornado crossed the North Saskatchewan River, it weakened considerably, entering the far east side of Clareview. The damage here varied greatly, many houses receiving roof damage, while three houses in the far eastern row on 19th Street were all but swept away. Thankfully, no one here was killed, despite Rod Grandish's newborn son being lifted out of his crib by the tornado and placed on the floor, then covered in debris. And by this point, the tornado had shrunk considerably in size, finally leaving the 216 loop and exiting Edmonton proper. But there was one unfortunate problem. Just to the northeast lies Evergreen, a mobile home community consisting of 723 buildings and over a thousand residents. And this tornado, now at F3 strength, barreled right through the center of the community. Some of the accounts from the survivors are terrifyingly tragic, and I won't go into too much detail. 208 of the mobile homes were completely destroyed, about a third of the entire park. 
severed power lines and phone lines cut off communication to the rest of the city, so Evergreen had no way of calling for help. The first call for help actually came from the Alberta Hospital, who received many patients from Evergreen and relayed the information to the police department. This incident more than doubled the death toll of the tornado, adding another 15 fatalities. The tornado was on the ground for 19 miles, 31 kilometers in over an hour. It was quite a slow moving storm compared to many other supercells, and that caused many more issues than just tornado damage. The rain itself caused significant flooding around the city, with many roads and low-lying areas collecting several feet of water. Immediately after the tornado, the main focus is always search and rescue. There were dozens of people stuck underneath piles of debris from collapsed homes and warehouses, and it's always a race against time. Here, a rescue crew is searching for the owner of a lumberyard who is buried beneath this collapsed warehouse. This was filmed at 1 a.m., and the scene is being illuminated by movie studio lights brought in by a local television station. The police, fire department, militia, air force, and emergency management services from every surrounding community were deployed in full force those first few days. Virtually everyone was accounted for just 24 hours after the tornado. Thousands of dollars in donations poured in from across North America, including food and clothing, and it took weeks for volunteers to sort through it all. Similar to how the Plainfield disaster of 1990 changed how the National Weather Service viewed tornado warnings, the Edmonton tornado was a big wake-up call for Environment Canada. They didn't do anything wrong, per se. They warned of violent thunderstorms in the afternoon and issued a tornado warning at the first report of a funnel. But the upgrade to Doppler radar had to be done and four years later, they did it. Within weeks after the tornado, people in the Evergreen community in Clairview were surveyed about their experience. They were asked if they were hit by the tornado, if they had property damage, if they even knew there was a tornado warning, and how they were notified of the warning. Of the 125 participants, only 17 said that they knew a tornado was coming before it hit, and get this, of those 17 participants, seven knew about the tornado because they physically saw it approaching their house. Data from the industrial area, on the other hand, was very mixed, so no real conclusions could be drawn. Maybe if the people of Evergreen actually knew a tornado was coming, they would have been able to leave. That's not necessarily saying that a lot of them would have left, but it's a lot better to have a choice. Thankfully, in today's era of the smartphone, there are countless ways to receive a tornado warning when they're issued. That particular problem has been solved. I hope you guys enjoyed learning about a very defining moment in the history of Edmonton and severe weather in all of Canada. If you love learning about tornadoes, if you love learning about weather in general, hit that like button, subscribe, hit that notification bell so you know when I post, and leave your thoughts in the comments below. If you're watching this in August, it's likely I'm in Maine right now. I will be back the first week of September, so I will see you guys soon. Have a good week.